Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to Brain and Mind. This is the seventh year of this series that it's now been running, and I'm pleased to say that we survived even the pandemic. During lockdown, we managed to hold two online events. One featured the St. Hilda's Committee, that is Professor Micah Glitch, Dr. Anne Dauker, and myself, representing neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy. And the topic was Brain and Mind, Understanding the Relationship. The second of our online events was on the topic of music and the brain, and this featured Dr. Victoria Bayo, representing neuroscience, Professor Eric Clark, representing psychology, and Professor Nick Zangwell, representing philosophy. Both online events were remarkably successful. We need to draw people back in, actually. Maybe it was too successful. And, we're still, and they're still available online for you to watch, should you be interested. Now, one of the lessons of the pandemic is that so many, that so many institutions have learned is that there's a wide constituency eager to attend events. And that with the help of modern technology, with which we all became so familiar during lockdown, we're now in a position to continue to reach this constituency post-lockdown. So I'm pleased to say that the Brain and Mind Committee have decided at least to try to make our event a hybrid one. Tonight we will be live streaming the event in real time, and it will also be available online, like all our events, to be watched at your leisure at some future time. And I should say that when it comes to the Q&A, if you don't want to have your voice heard live stream, it will just be your voice, then come up afterwards and ask your question. But if you do raise your hand, you will be heard on live stream. Brain and Mind is taking another step away from our old format. And this is particularly exciting for us at St. Hilda's. I want to tell you about this new venture but first, I'm going to introduce you to members of the executive committee who are responsible for setting up these lectures. These are the speak people who I mentioned earlier spoke at one of the online events. They are as follows. Representing psychology is Dr. Anne Dauker. Dr. Dauker's work is largely concerned with the areas of psychology that have to do with developmental psychology, psychology of education, and individual differences and she's carried out extensive research on individual differences in arithmetic in both children and adults and on the phenomenon of mathematics anxiety. And do say hello. Hello. Nice to see everybody in person now. Now, for reasons that will soon become obvious, I'm going to introduce myself next. I represent philosophy on the executive committee, and my own research is in the philosophy of mind and language, and the bulk of my publications in the last 20 years or so has been on the topic of other minds, how we know the minds of others and how we understand our relations to others. The third and final member of the executive committee and the member who represents neuroscience is Professor Micah Glitch. Until September 2021, Professor Glitch was a fellow in medicine here at St. Hilda's College and a lecturer in the Department of Biomedical Science at Oxford. Her research interests center around communication between cells and their environment in the mammalian brain. In September 2021, Professor Glitch transferred from Oxford to a post in the medical school Hamburg. Professor Glitch was, along with myself, a founding member of Brain and Mind. The idea for it came about over lunch one day over seven years ago when Professor Glitch and myself found ourselves with coinciding interests, despite the very different disciplines that we were coming from. Now, when Professor Glitch moved to the medical school in Hamburg, she was very keen not to lose her connection with this event. As a result, she has managed to persuade the medical school Hamburg to join us and support Brain and Mind. Micah, I'm gonna have you say hello from afar. Can you just say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really excited that we can have this event now between two sites in Hamburg and in, in Oxford in St. Hilda's College. Uh, as you can see, we have a slightly small audience who's starting small with baby steps. Uh, we're hoping to build up 
and to get a much larger audience as time goes by. But thank you very much everybody for coming and we're really excited to be having this event as well. Thank you, Micah. Now, as you've just discovered, you can't see Micah. We don't have the technology for that yet, but we can hear her, and we're just going to have to work on getting that clarity. Um, I hope we can hear better as, as the evening goes on. They can see us, and they can hear us, okay? Um, in fact, what they see is this. They don't actually see you. They see the audience, um, the, uh, the speakers, the platform up here. So from now on, we're going to be running this event in collaboration with the Medical School Hamburg. Indeed, our speaker representing neuroscience this evening is Professor Ulf Baumgartner, who has flown in from Hamburg to be with us tonight. Also, the event is being live streamed through the Medical School Hamburg. Um, now, so I, I, I have to look at the cameras up there. I have to get used to this as well. Welcome to our audience in Hamburg. We very much hope you enjoy the evening and we look forward to a fruitful collaboration between the Medical School Hamburg and St. Hilda's College here in Oxford. The members of the Executive Committee would like to thank both St. Hilda's and the Medical School Hamburg for their generous help in funding and in organizing the series of events. Now, let's turn to tonight's event, Pain and the Brain. Pain is something we are all, or at least virtually all, intimately aware of. It's something we think of as what each of us, as individuals, suffers. At the same time, it's something we dearly would love to understand. We, under, we want to understand what pain is, why we suffer from it, and how we might control pain in our lives. Is pain really something that must be felt to exist? And as well as physical pain, we mustn't forget the very real psychological pain that we all sometimes suffer in our lives. I don't mean headaches, that's a physical pain, but something more like anguish, the pain of sorrow, of shame, anxiety, and the like. To talk to us tonight about different aspects of this phenomenon we call pain are three experts. We shall begin the evening by hearing about pain from the perspective of neuroscience. Our speaker tonight is Professor Ulf Baumgartner from the Medical School Hamburg. Professor Baumgartner has done much research in the area of clinical neurophysiology in connection with stroke victims and patients with psychiatric disorders, such as borderline personality disorder, who have altered pain processing. He has studied, among other things, the cortical representation of pain using neuroimaging techniques. And his talk tonight is entitled, is there something like an ouch center? Over to you. Yes, hello everyone, uh, dear students, colleagues, and friends of the brain. It's an honor for me to be here, and um, thank you very much for the kind um, explanation of who I am. So I don't have to say anything about that anymore, except uh, the fact that I've been in Oxford for two weeks, more than 10 years ago, for a couple of experiments, the outcome of which I will share with you later on. And uh, I will start my talk, um, and the, the title, I changed the title a little bit, not to confuse everyone, but because it's, um, in fact, comprising the other thing a bit. So the, the, the more general question is, where is the pain in the body or in the brain? Of course, in the end, it's somehow the brain processing everything, but that's, but that's not so easy and clear in every case, as we will see. So um, first, we'll need a little bit of vocabulary, very little, don't worry. Have you started up your PowerPoint? Um, start it up, I gather. No, OK. Now I have, right. So, um, then um, I will give a brief overview about the nociceptive system, so the wiring of the periphery to the brain and normal processing, and then talk a little about, about the search for the pain center, uh, so the ouch center, here it is, and then we will have a look at some pain phenomena. Some, will, some of them you will know, others not probably and in the end, briefly touch upon pain as a disease. So vocabulary. Um, 
as um, termed by the International Association of the, for the Study of Pain. Pain is an unpleasant sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage that comprises uh, quite a lot. And um, something else what is important and uh, is that pain is, a, as everyone knows, a multifactorial percept. There is a sensory discriminative component telling us where the pain is, how intense it is, so the more neutral aspects. And then, then we have the effective motivational component, so how unpleasant is the pain, and uh, a cognitive evaluative component, how is the actual pain compared that pains that I experienced earlier on. So all of this cannot take place in the, in the finger or somewhere in the cable. Uh, of course, uh, pain arises inside the brain. Then there's the term of nociception, and that's the processing of nociceptive stimuli. In other words, electricity in our nerves, so the neutral processing. And uh, nociception comes from the Latin word noxa, damage. And the nociceptors are, of course, the sensors detecting these signals. Right. Now, um, what are nociceptive, physical nociceptive stimuli? Of course, uh, thermal and uh, chemical stimuli, uh, like uh, acid or uh, the ingredient of the hot chili pepper, capsaicin, as you may know, uh, David Julius was just awarded the Nobel Prize for having described the capsaicin receptor. And um, there are mechanical uh, stimuli, sharp and dull. Now these sensors are, of course, then located, uh, of course, you have to learn these shortages by heart. Uh, they are located in the, in the tissue and in the nerve fibers. We have different ion channels that are more or less responsive to all of these different stimuli. And then these signals are transmitted to the central nervous system and already the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. And on that level already, we have responses like withdrawal. So when we step on a nail, we have, don't have to think about half an hour what to do. It's a reflex, we withdraw the foot. And the signal is passed on to the brain where we feel pain, um, show an avoidance behavior and um, have an emotional reaction as well. Now, what are the uh, centers in the brain or the areas that get activated when we receive a physical stimulus? So where's the ouch center? And as everyone can see, there is no single ouch center. There are many different regions other than, for instance, for visual stimuli where we really have a primary visual cortex. There is no primary pain cortex. So there are uh, different areas. This part here, the sensory cortices, they, they would um, process the sensory aspects of pain. Then there are medial structures here, like the cingulate cortex, better to see here, uh, which are processing more the affective and the behavioral aspects of pain. But so it's, it's, a, it's in fact, it's a really a network. Nice so far. We have a pain network when we give a clearly painful stimulus, a pain network lights up. It's not so nice because this network, when you now look from top to bottom, lights up under a variety of conditions. These are maps of brain, activ brain activation following different sorts of sensory stimuli. On top, it's nociceptive, so painful stimuli. Then we have touch in purple, auditory stimuli and visual stimuli, and these activity maps look pretty much the same, not identical, but there is a strong overlap. And the explanation for that is that this is termed a sort of a salience or attention network because when any uh, stimulus from, from the outer world uh, enters our personality in a way, it means something to us and we have to react. And that's a very generalized phenomenon. So where is really the specific, the, the specific um, pain part here? And um, this has been... Um, published by Tor Weger from Colorado and his group. And they um, found a signature out of a number of these regions that we just saw. So here the cingulate cortex, the insula, and sensory cortices, which get 
activated and deactivated with increasing thermal heat. And they trained an algorithm by machine learning to detect what areas get activated and deactivated. And then, after this uh, algorithm had learned uh, what this network is, they let it loose on new data sets and found that it was only responsive to really to physical heat and not to other conditions like pain, uh, uh, pain anticipa anticipation or also psychological pain. There, uh, this uh, signature was not responsive to these. So there is a network uh, that is responsive to these sort of stimuli. Now, um, if we find a co uh, body representation, uh, spatial representation of the stimuli like a map, that is something must be something more meaningful than just salience. And um, here we are, uh, 15 years ago in Oxford, uh, when I was in, uh, oh, the, the picture of Irene Tracy is missing, sorry, uh, how that uh, could happen, uh, it was not by purpose. Um, so that was an Irene Tracy's lab together with Gian Domenico Iannetti. Um, we published a paper in where we gave uh, mechanical and heat stimuli to the hand and foot and were simply looking is there a hand-foot representation in the human insula? And the insula is shown here on the slice uh, on, the, on the left side. And here we see what uh, happened when we did thermal stimulation. So not, without touch heat stimuli, we got an uh, anterior representation for hand and posterior for foot. So in the periphery, we stimulated with a laser hand and foot and found uh, significantly different centers of activity, and it was systematically hand anterior to foot. And also for the mechanical stimuli, hand was anterior to foot. So there was some very crude hand and foot body map in the insula. Now this was again from um, bottom to top. Uh, what happens when, uh, when we look for the projection the other way around? So can we find a pathway where we stimulate the brain and uh, get pain somewhere in the body. And there's only one single region in the body, uh, in the brain, where you can elicit really painful experiences when you give electrical stimuli uh, during neurosurgery. And this has been done in epilepsy, epilepsy patients uh, who were recorded, of course, for finding the epileptic focus. And this is uh, um, in fact, a meta-analysis where all the contacts of many patients were projected onto one brain. All the white dots here are the insular context, uh, contacts where stimulation took place. And out of these 150-something contacts, 27 were responsive in the, in the way that uh, electrical stimulation at these spots yielded um, uh, um, circumscribed pain responses in the patients. And well, in these during these procedures, the patient is awake and you can talk to the patient and he, re can, he can respond. And when contacts in these areas here were stimulated, patients felt uh, pain in the face. When the green contacts were stimulated, pain in the hand and red contacts led to pain in the leg. So we have this um, superior, inferior, or anterior, posterior gradient of representation similar to the one that we found in the stimulation study. So uh, the posterior insula seems to be an important node at least. And um, what is more, there's a, this uh, single case report which is underlining the importance of the insula in pain processing. That was a patient who experienced excruciating, excruciating attacks of pain and nobody was believing that was real. They first sent him to psychiatry. Until then someone said, well, let's make an MRI scan. And this lesion here in the um, posterior insula was identified and then they induced electrical contacts or recording electrodes. We can always stimulate and record. And um, you can maybe you can identify here the letters uh, that correspond to the electrodes and an electrode A, which is near the lesion, 
we, they had this large discharge as the onset of the seizure and then the clinical pain uh, occurred. So that was sort of a really a pain epilepsy. Now um, to um, go a little bit on the level of concepts, how do we localize pain? Normal is stimulus occurs, it's transmitted to the brain, brain is activated and then there's a back projection where the cable came from and we feel pain, for instance, in the hand. And there can be, of course, disruptions. So just to illustrate that, um, when there's, uh, well, this is the human in the eyes of a neurophysiologist, almost complete, one limb, some cables, spinal cord and brain. And when the hand is, well, injured, the signal occurs right there, is transmitted through the cables to the spinal cord and brain. Brain is activated. Let's leave, let's leave out whether it's the insula or the network, doesn't matter at this point. And then there's a back projection to the hand, and we know pain occurred in the hand. Now, what you probably all know is the uh, projected pain. This is when there's an injury somewhere else. For instance, you hit your elbow at the edge of a table, and uh, the nerve is irritated at the elbow. Signal is transmitted to the brain, and the back projection takes place not to the elbow, but to the end of the cable or the origin of the map, the hand. So you have the perception in the hand, although nothing happened to the hand. That's projected pain. A special uh, version of projected pain is phantom pain, when there is no hand at all, and uh, an excitation takes place either at the, stu at, at the stump or the ascending pathway. Signal is transmitted to the brain, and the brain now mislocalizes in a couple of patients. Of course, not every amputee has this. Uh, and then the projection is sometimes back to the non-existing hand. And that's a special form of uh, projected pain. What has been found, uh, because phantom pain, of course, is always uh, intriguing and interesting, um, is this landmark paper by Hertha Flohr, quite old meanwhile, I mean the paper. And um, what did she do, or his, uh, her group? They stimulated um, patients with, with amputations and normal people uh, on the body surface, on the hand, and on the lip. And they looked for the areas that were uh, active in the brain. So when they stimulated the hand, the normal hand in the amputees and healthy subjects, the hand area was represented here. They used magnetoencephalography to uh, localize the activity. And when they stimulated the lip, that was located here. So this is the drawing of this uh, body map. So lip here and hand there. And uh, healthy control is white and black is the patient. Now, um, on the contralateral side, of course, there is no hand area because in the amputee there is no hand, so they couldn't test this, but they could stimulate the lip. And the lip, shown in black here for the amputated patients, the lip area is now severely shifted towards the previous hand area. So there's a shift of this representation of the lip or the, or the face towards the hand. And um, an interpretation could be that the hand area is not used anymore. The term use-dependent use plasticity uh, was induced and uh, the neighboring areas in a way invade the, uh, the old uh, unused area. So there was this shift. And um, in, in patients with phantom limb pain, the intensity of the pain was correlated with the degree of the shift. So the larger the shift, the stronger the pain. So if there's a causal relationship, of course, we cannot say. And there's also this chicken and egg problem, but that's a phenomenon. Now there's also something else called referred pain. You may have realized some new thing has popped up here. That's an organ. I just chose the heart because it's relatively well, not so rare. Um, and when now an inner organ is damaged, like in an uh, ischemic heart attack, um, there's neural signaling. 
uh, to the spinal cord and brain, but now look, the important thing is that we have a projection of two areas onto the same neuron in the spinal cord. So we have a wiring of a superficial part of the skin, for instance, and part of an organ, for they project onto the same pathway in the spinal cord. And now the back projection takes the wrong way, in a way. And uh, when people have a heart attack, they typically feel the pain in the chest or maybe uh, the, the arm, not inside the heart, because there's a, this referred pain. And that was described and mapped by somebody uh, by the name, maybe you know him, Sir Henry Head from London, a neurologist, uh, who found this in his patients who had uh, tendernesses on their, in the, on their skin, on the body surface, and, they, uh, and he uh, mapped these areas uh, for organ damages. Now there's some, something even more weird. There's, uh, there's a so-called illusion of pain. And um, that's pain without nociception. So there is no damage, but a pain perception. And that was described already quite some time ago, uh, in 1896, by somebody by the name of Thunberg from Norway. And um, he constructed the so-called thermal grill. What is the thermal grill? It's tubes filled with water. They can be heated individually. So every single bar can be heated or cooled. And um, the normal um, perception is when all bars are cool. Of course, if you put your hand on this, you feel cool. Uh, and when they are warm, you feel warm. And important here is that the temperatures are not nociceptive. So this is not ice cold, this is just cool. And this is not hot burning, this is just warm. So no nociceptors are excited. But the perception when now every second bar is heated or cooled with this temperature is burning. So you perceive, most of the people perceive it as a burning pain, although there is no nociception at all. Lastly, um, I'd like to show you or compare the normal uh, case of pain and the pathologic case. Uh, pain uh, is, a, is, of course, a warning system, a, a beneficial thing. So if you have a damage somewhere, the signal is transmitted through the wires to the alarm system and pain is elicited. And if you don't have this warning system, like in uh, children with congenital insensitivity to pain, they hurt themselves very badly because they don't feel it. Then there's the case of neuropathic pain where the alarm system is damaged. So the cables or relays of the system are uh, mad and somewhere is uh, some excitability generated erroneously inside the system, and without reason, uh, there is ongoing pain without cause, in fact. And one example is post-herpetic neuralgia, where the virus is already gone out of your nerves, and the pain persists, and that's very difficult to heal. Now let me conclude, there is no uh, ouch center, but a network, and this network in principle is not specific for pain. But the insula plays to, uh, seems to play an important role here. The origin uh, of pain um, in, the, in, the, in the body part may be felt correctly or may be, uh, may be in a different place. Uh, there can be pain without nociception at all, for instance, as shown by the sensory illusion here, or when the system is damaged, or what I haven't talked about by hyp hypnosis, so you can suggest there is pain, and in fact there isn't. And also when the pain memory is triggered, the pain can also evolve. And with this, I thank you very much. And Thank you so much. That was a perfect start for the evening. So we'll hold questions. No, none now, because we're going to have the second speaker before we have any questions. And I'm sure there will be some. Um, I have some if <laughs> nobody else does. So our second speaker tonight, this evening, is Dr. Emma Fisher. 
Dr. Fisher is a research fellow at the University of Bath. Her primary research interests focus on the risk factors of developing chronic pain after an acute musculoskeletal injury in children and ad adolescents. Her other research interests include anxiety in children and adolescents with chronic pain, goal pursuit when experiencing pain, and pain after surgery in young people. The title of her talk this evening is Chronic Pain in Children and Adolescents, Do the Treatments Work? Emma. Um, I think we just, let's see, get a little change over. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. This is quite exciting. It's been two and a half years since my last in-person talk, so this feels very 2019 for me. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be talking about treatments in chronic pain um, and particularly focusing on paediatrics. Um, as um, I've just been introduced, I'm at the University of Bath, but I'm also an editor at the Cochrane Palliative, uh, Pain Palliative and Supportive Care Review Group. So why should you care about pain? This is where I want to start. Um, if you're not convinced for, by the first speaker, then I'm going to try and convince you a little bit more. Um, first of all, as we've already said, pain is something that is part of all of our lives. Um, almost everyone on the planet will experience pain. You're normally born in pain. You will probably die in pain, unfortunately. Um, and it's something that happens throughout all of childhood. So um, as you can see the three photos on the right, as a baby, um, babies often cry a lot. This is my uh, six week, well, she's now 11 months, but this is about my, my daughter when she was about six weeks old, um, screaming at me for some unknown reason to me because she's not very good at communicating uh, with words yet. Um, but she was obviously in pain at this time and I knew very little about what to do with her. Their babies are often immunized. I think they have about 11 immu immunizations before they're 12 months. Um, and then as a toddler, as they navigate the world, they often fall, um, they trip, they eat things that they probably shouldn't do. Um, and then as we reach into kind of later childhood and adolescence, you often get growing pains, abdominal pains, headaches. Um, we know that children um, and young adolescents experience a lot of musculoskeletal pain. Um, and so it's something that happens regularly. Not only does acute pain happen that's warning us um, that there is danger in our environment, but it's also very attention-grabbing. So when you experience intense pain, it's very hard to concentrate on what you want to do or what you should be doing. Um, so that can interfere with children's school. Um, it can interfere with their socialization and, and seeing friends and going shopping, going to the movies, all those things that you did pre-pandemic. Um, and it also interferes with people's mental health. So when you feel pain persistently, day after day after day, it gets you down. You start to feel anxious about perhaps going to the shops because you don't want to have another pain episode. So it really impacts every domain of our functioning when we experience pain. But what's good news is that we're making huge progress in this field. So within paediatric pain over the last 50 years, we've come on leaps and bounds in understanding pain in children and adolescents. And I think that this is shown most through um, a, a mother um, of Jeffrey Lawson, who 30 years ago, her, her baby, Jeffrey, sadly died. He was a premier baby. Um, and medical professionals at that time believed that babies didn't feel pain, and so they would operate on them with no anesthesia. They would just be given a paralytic, be taken into surgery, and then operated on. And unsurprisingly, um, with hindsight, a lot of these babies died. And it took a mother to kind of investigate what anesthesia and what painkillers this baby was given. Her baby was given um, during these operations that he was had to undergo as a premature baby, and then really advocate that babies do feel pain and that they should be given the same types of painkillers. So if you know anyone, or if you are over the age of 30, um, then it's likely that if you were a premature baby that you weren't um, given anesthesia as, as a very young baby. So we're coming on leaps and bounds, but we've still got a long way to go. And my interest is really in children with chronic pain. Um, now, chronic pain is defined in the literature as pain lasting for longer than three months, and there's obviously some limitations with that definition. Um, often people will have pain, 
And uh, if you think about something very classic like um, menstrual pain, menstrual pain generally happens to women every month, but we wouldn't necessarily describe that as chronic pain. Um, but what we know is that 15 to 30% of children report pain lasting for longer than three months. And 8% of all children are disabled by their pain. And when I talk about disabling chronic pain, I'm meaning that these children are missing school. So they're not going to their usual classes. They're not seeing their friends on a daily basis, which we know is important for development. Um, and they're, they're reporting higher levels of anxiety and depression. Um, and they're just not able to do what they should be doing and what society expects of a child. It also impacts on their parents because the parent has to take time off work to be able to care for their child, to take their child to different doctor's appointments. Um, and so the parent isn't going about what they should be doing and they actually report a higher level of burden of care for caring for their child as well as higher levels of distress. So it's understandable that these children would want to go and get treated for their pain and would want to access healthcare professionals um, who should know what they're doing uh, and receive treatment. And there's been a recent World Health Organization guideline that recommends that treatment should be multidisciplinary. So bringing different healthcare professionals from different, different areas of the medical specialty together to be able to treat these children. And what they recommend is a pharmacological, a physical, and a psychological approach to managing children with chronic pain. And this is really important because we don't think of pain anymore just as a medical problem. Pain is biopsychosocial. It's biological. It's what you're made up of. It's psychological, so it's how you're feeling. It's what you're doing. And it's social, so it's the people who are around you and things that might have happened to you in the past. But to access these treatments, it can be incredibly hard. If you go to your GP um, with a chronic pain condition, then you'll probably get bounced around a number of medical specialties. For example, neurology. You might go to a gastro clinic if, um, if you have recurrent abdominal pain. And there might not necessarily be anything wrong. Nothing might not show up on the scans that they do. And the doctors really don't know what to do with you. And so it takes a long time, A, to be able to access and be referred to a chronic pain clinic, but once you're there, it takes you a long time to actually see anyone. So we know that wait times are around about six months or longer, um, and we know that children don't get better during that time. So once they have chronic pain, they normally continue to have chronic pain, and they either stay the same or they get worse. So their pain increases, their mental health declines, their physical activity decreases. And alongside that, you've also got sleep. Sleep and pain are, are often bidirectional. Uh, one impacts the other. Um, and so these kids are just kind of falling into a bad place. So when we think about the evidence and um, think about this, then looking across these three different modalities, we can review the literature. So what randomized control trials have been done across pharmacological, physical, and psychological trials? And what we can see is that most studies that have been done to help children manage their pain have been done in psychology. Now, obviously, when people have pain, they normally reach for the paracetamol or the ibuprofen, right? But there's actually been very few studies that have been done in this area. And there's kind of historical reasons for that. So, for example, the FDA um, didn't... Um, insist that new analgesics, new painkillers, should be tested in children until about 2003. And even then, drug companies could get around it. But really, there's been no new analgesics since that time. So there's been very little randomized control trials looking at how drugs work and who they work for in children. Physical trials, so physiotherapy, um, is just further behind in the field, sadly. But there are more trials coming through. Um, but as you can see, there's less than 1,000 patients recruited across all chronic pain conditions. And this includes cancer-related pain as well. But psychology has done a little bit better. So we have 63 RCTs and just over 5,000 participants that have been entered into trials to date. But if you look at the other things, so age and sex, and if I showed you kind of a world map of where these studies are conducted, they're all more or less the same. So they're around about early adolescence. There's generally more females enrolled than males. And they're, they're all done in westernized developed countries. So I'm going to talk mostly about psychological trials today because that's where the literature is. That's where my um, main interest lies. And what we can see is that most trials have been delivered face-to-face. -face. There are some that have been delivered remotely. So that's via the internet or an app or this thing called a CD-ROM, which was just after the floppy disk, um, <laughs> if you remember that far back, um, but certainly before the internet. 
Um, and most of the psychological treatments delivered to these children are cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's a talking therapy. It addresses thoughts and feelings and behaviors. Um, and it's normally delivered across kind of eight to 12 weeks by a psychologist or, or someone training to be a psychologist. There are other therapies, as you can see up there. So there's acceptance commitment therapy, um, which some people would argue is a third wave CBT. Uh, problem solving therapy, where people kind of focus on a problem, generate loads of solutions, go try them out and come back and evaluate. Uh, hypnosis, behavior therapy, relaxation. I'll give that lecture another day. <laughs> um, so most of them are delivered face to face. Some of them are done remotely. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you some of the results as to whether these psychological therapies work. Now, when we do this analysis, we put together all the psychological therapies together because, to be honest, most of them are CBT or a variation of CBT. Um, so we bundle all of those together, and then we compare them. Um, each of these trials compares a psychological therapy to an active arm, which is something like education. They're giving the participants something rather than nothing. Or standard care, so they just carry on with whatever standard medical regime that they're on, or their waiting list um, which they might not be, have anything, but they're probably on some painkillers. Now, there's certain ways to um, turn off an audience, and that is by showing them far too many um, meta-analyses. So I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to show you three meta-analyses um, and one big table. So I don't expect you to understand all of this. Um, if you take anything away, then the thing in green, the, the lines in green, are what work. And the lines in black is where psychological um, interventions don't have any effect. Now, if I was looking at this uh, table, the first thing I would say is, Emma, there's not very much green up there. Um, <laughs> are you sure you're in the right business here? Um, but what I want to share with you is that psychological treatments are beneficial. So they are beneficial for reducing pain at post-treatment, and they are beneficial at reducing um, physical disability at post-treatment and at follow-up. And these analyses are done in, in a fair group of patients, you know, between 1,700 and 3,000 patients. The effect sizes are small, but nothing in pain works. And that there is no magic bullet, so small is good. Um, now, when it comes to where they don't work, there's a reason for this. So we aren't seeing any gains in emotional functioning such as anxiety and depression. But these treatments aren't trying to change anxiety and depression. There is no content that you would normally see in an anxiety or a depression um, intervention that are included in these pain treatments. These pain treatments are trying to get kids moving again. If they get them moving again, we often see decreases in pain intensity. Um, if you look down at the sleep, so towards the bottom of this slide, that also isn't working, but no one's measuring it. So if we don't measure it, then we're not going to see gains in it. Similarly, they're not trying to change these people's sleep. So it's unsurprising that we don't see any changes there. Adverse events are also important to um, recognize and to assess. Um, sadly, not many people are doing it, but it is becoming a thing now in psychology. You know, adverse events shouldn't just be assessed in pharmacological trials with drugs, but we should be assessing them across all different literatures. And then the last one is health-related quality of life, which is the one between pain and um, disability. And again, not many people are measuring it, um, and we're not seeing any benefits, but that might be because that benefit comes later on down the line. Now, the right-hand column that says certainty of evidence tells you how sure you can be that something is working. And this ranges from very low to high. Um, so at the minute, we are rating studies as low quality. And there's reasons for this, because a lot of these studies are done kind of a long time ago in the 80s and the 90s. They don't adhere to the quality standards that we have in place today. So if it has low or very low quality, that means that if a big trial came along, it is likely to change the effect. And that might make this effect more beneficial, or it might take it to the null and show that psychological treatments don't work. But I think that we can be fairly confident that psychological therapies are impacting pain intensity and are impacting disability. So here's your first meta-analysis. If you don't understand meta-analyses, then please don't worry. Uh, can you see my... My pointer. Yeah, okay. So anything, you see this line here, anything to the left of this line means that psychological therapies are working. Anything to the right of the line means that psychological therapies aren't having an effect. 
So this is um, a meta-analysis of pain intensity at post-treatment uh, from the table that I just showed you. And what I want to show you here is this is the risk of bias. So this is kind of like a traffic light sy system. If it's green, it's good. If it's red, it's bad. If it's yellow, that means that it's unclear. So it's, it's kind of more bad than good. And what this meta-analysis shows you is that psychological treatments are benefiting pain intensity. Um, you can see the effect down here, minus 0.29, and then you can see the p-value just here. Um, so this is significant. What I'm going to show you next is a similar meta-analysis also done in pain intensity at post-treatment. This one is a little bit smaller because we kicked out all the headache studies. Um, and we split this meta-analysis between big and small studies. Now, the big studies are the studies that include 20 participants or more in each arm, and the small studies are studies that include less than 20 participants per arm. Now, big isn't necessarily big in this case, but it was the best that we could work with. If we'd put in the standards that we would want to have put in, um, then we actually would only have small studies. So, so this is just showing you big versus small. And what I want you to take note of here is that in these small studies, there's a, mo a lot more yellow in the risk of bias compared to the larger studies. And these lines around these green dots are a lot wider. They're all showing very beneficial effects. And what's important to note here is that smaller studies are more imprecise. If I gave you the grade ratings for this, then smaller studies would be very low quality and larger studies would be low to moderate quality. Even though you're seeing smaller effects for larger studies, it's important to be critical when you're reviewing any meta-analysis that if they include lots of small studies, then it's likely to be, you're likely to have an imprecision issue and the chance of random effect is likely to be higher. So, if you, so look at the larger studies um, and base your, your judgment on this, this bottom meta-analysis. There's some red lines. Okay, um, so finally, if you are interested in face-to-face -face versus remotely delivered therapies, um, as is very important in this new COVID era that we are in, then they roughly work out the same in terms of reducing pain intensity and disability. So they both work, which is really good news. Um, and often we find that remotely delivered therapies are moderate quality, so we can trust them a bit more, we're a bit more confident in the estimate of the effect, versus face-to-face -face therapies that are lower quality. This is simply because remotely delivered therapies are generally newer trials, um, so they're adhering to the high quality standards that we expect, and they're often larger because they can deliver treatment to a larger number of people. So in terms of moving forwards and thinking about where we can go next in this field, um, the Lancet... Uh, Child and Adolescent Health Journal published a commission at the beginning of this year thinking about transformative action for pediatric pain. And it really is time where we can make the, the next big leaps and bounds in this area. And they come up, well, we came up with four different goals. So to make pain matter, to make it understood, visible, and make it better. Now, this talk obviously falls into the make pain better goal, but it actually transcends all three goals. So to make pain to make pain better, we have to make it matter in the first place. We have to have doctors understand about chronic pain. They have to take the patient seriously. Often what you get from the qualitative research in pediatric pain is, my doctor didn't believe me. I had to keep on advocating. I had to go back to him or her several times so that they would trust me and they would believe me so that I could get the treatment that I thought that I deserved. So pain has to matter. It has to be understood by all of the medical professional as well as the wider public so that we're not dismissing people or children with chronic pain. Um, and there's so much more, as we've heard from our first talk, about understanding how pain is processed in the brain, how pain is presented. There's so many more leaps and bounds that we can make in that area. In terms of making pain visible, it would be great as a meta-analysis um, if everyone used the same measures in the same populations. Um, and, you know, we've got a pretty good armory of um, self-report measures, but we need more. We need to understand what's important to patients, where they value um, the gains in treatment and what they think that we should be assessing. And we ought to be assessing it not just in the middle class, white Caucasian, in well-developed countries, but we need to branch out from that. Um, research at the minute within pain psychology is very focused to that, um, that group of people. And then finally, we obviously need to make pain better. 
we can go so much further with different psychological interventions in terms of delivering the emotional component of trying to reduce their anxiety and their depression, trying to improve the child's insomnia. And if we can tag on these different components onto our pain treatments, then hopefully we can help to address all of the problems that these children present with rather than just their pain and then not helping with any other aspect. And there's like loads of opportunities here that we could pursue. So one model that we've proposed is to start using big data, small data as well as big data. Everyone probably has a phone on them tonight, I'm guessing. That phone is collecting so much data about where you are, what you're doing, how you're feeling. Your social media channels are influencing all of those things. Um, and we can collect all of that data and input it, as well as the clinical evidence that we have, as well as the personality um, and, um, and kind of small data, big data, clinical evidence. We can input all of that into something that I don't necessarily understand and might not have been invented yet, but we've got to aspire to something, to then be able to deliver personalised interventions. So it might be that an adolescent needs more peer support, or they might need a complex intervention, or they might just need a doctor to give them some coping skills. But at the minute, we're finding that chronic pain clinics are in urbanised and in tertiary settings. And if we can move that specialism out to the community, then we're going to be able to be a lot better at helping to... Um, manage children's pain in the community, which is where they would prefer to be um, seen, and helping them get better. So if you are interested in this area, then there's a lot of resources out there for you. Um, there is the systematic review that I've spoken about most today, uh, published in pain, as well as the guidelines um, in the, that are now online from the World Health Organization. But there's also um, a special collection on the Cochrane website that includes all of the systematic reviews of pain in pediatrics. And it's just left to me to say thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, thank you to Chris and Andrew um, for guiding a lot of my thoughts in this area. Um, my co-authors, who seem to avoid me after we've finished a review and don't talk to me for a year because I think they're worried that I'm going to invite them to do another one, um, and to Fafas and Cochrane Response. And then finally, this is our group at Bath. Um, and very happy to take questions and go forward. Thank you. Thanks. Fantastic. So you can see, I didn't say because I think people know who have been coming to these events, that we are approaching a topic tonight, pain, from the different disciplines. And you can see, I think we've moved from the sort of physical, biological level, we've moved to the behavioral. And um, we'll, we'll move on to, you'll see what philosophy does with pain in a minute, well, in a few minutes. But now I'm going to ask you if you have questions, and I'm going to take a couple from the audience, and then I'm going to look over there and see if we have any questions from Hamburg. So if you raise your hand, and we have some roving mics, uh, which are important so they can hear you in Hamburg, okay? So please, uh, for either of the, speak the two speakers that we've had so far. So we have one back here. Um, do I just say, okay. Um, and I saw Dr. Fisher, you said that um, women or girls are more likely to have chronic pain. And I was just wondering if there's a like etiology for that. Is it like hormonal? Yeah, it's a good question. Speak into your microphone, please. Yeah. Okay. Is, can you hear me? Is that, that good? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So, um, no is the short answer. But what what is really interesting is that Chronic pain increases during early adolescence, we know that, and it increases more in girls than in, than in boys. But if you go back to the beginning, you know, when people actually experience pain for the first time, so a lot of chronic pain comes out of an injury, for example. More boys have injuries than girls do. Um, so you see higher levels of boys from sport or from tripping over, from playing, falling out of trees and things like that, and they're going to the ED for treatment, um, but then somewhere between recovery of that injury and then onset of chronic pain, you get this flip. So there's more girls going to the chronic pain treatments. And this is what my current research is focused on. So I suspect it's something to do with puberty and kind of critical points during the pubertal development, um, particularly in girls. So whether you experience it at the wrong time during your pubertal development or um, kind of sometime during a growth spurt or something like that. And we've got a lot of researchers at Bath um, interested in that as well. So I'll come back to you in three years and I'll let you know. <laughs> I think we have... 
question down here. Can you bring the mic? Thank you. Um, my question is also to um, Dr. Fisher. Um, so you mentioned this, this horrible fact that until 30 years ago, we just didn't know that babies had pain. Uh, that's, you know, I'm really curious about that and I just want to know, you know what, what was missing in our information that we just missed that really kind of important fact and how did we find out? I mean, what is sort of the, the evidence we have, you know, what determines which... Yeah. which um, yeah. So it, it's, it's really interesting because, um, as I said in my presentation, it, it was a, a little baby called Jeffrey Lawson who died um, and his mum went and pursued it. And around the same time, there were a group of researchers that were starting to look at the data in hospitals to see which babies were doing better than others. And they were starting to give some babies some anaesthetic because they thought it might be a good idea. But um, And then it was that data that then showed that babies that were anaesthetized um, were more likely to live um, and it was literally that stark. Um, and then, you know, it kind of gained traction. But before then, it was just a conception of the medical professionals because these babies couldn't really talk that they didn't feel pain. So so that was the journey that that went on. Um, and obviously now um, there's a lot more anesthesia going around, thankfully. <laughs> but they cried. Oh, yeah, they cried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yep. Just but. because they didn't say, I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Um, do we have My Micah over in Hamburg? Um, I'm waiting to see if you have a, a question. Do you want to come in? Yes, please. So we have a question. Yeah, in the background here, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, this is Caroline. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> Hi, I work in a children's home, and there's a boy who is 11 years old now. He has PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder and um, the, he has phases when he is highly aroused, when he is very angry or sad and there's moments um, he's throwing a fit and when he is touched in those moments he uh, described that he feels pain uh, far more severely than normally in everyday life and I always wondered um, how how that works and if there's anything I can do um, to help him or if there's treatment that could help him uh, cope with that. I think that's, that's me. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really, it. so is, is it's when he is... Could you say that again? Sorry, speak into the microphone. I thought maybe um, both speakers could, could answer that. Okay, we'll try and get both. Okay. So, so as I understand it, it's when the child is very aroused and having a fit, like an epileptic fit. Is that right? Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's yeah. correct. Okay. Um, so we know that a, to, when, you are, when you feel a little more arousal, and it, it really is a, a social situation as well, because if you imagine, say, a, a rugby match or a football match where um, a very competitive situation or, or out in a war zone or something like that, People can experience extremely painful injuries, but they don't report pain in that instance. But we also know that arousal can be associated with pain intensity. So um, certainly, like, that makes sense to me, that if he's very aroused and having a fit, then, then he's more likely to report pain. I think a lot of it is about decreasing the arousal um, and then giving him coping strategies to hopefully um, reduce the number of fits and, and the length of those, those fits. Um, well, is this on? Yeah. Yes. So um, uh, from, from the neurophysiologist's perspective, so arousal can be more or less two things. So attention towards one situation, to, to a, well, to oneself. If, uh, if, the, if the attention is directed towards oneself or to the pain, of course, then it increases. And if somebody um, is aroused in general, well, I don't know, during combat or whatever, then your uh, autonomic nervous system is flooding you with um, adrenaline and noradrenaline and that uh, severely uh, dampens the pain. And um, so uh, under these conditions, the pain is not really let into the bodies. And under these conditions, it's, however, it's difficult to understand why then later on 
um, these people have um, problems. So the, the question is, is, is the pain uh, entering the system anyway, or is it something else? So it's not, not very easy to answer. So it, it's a question of, uh, of the pers perspective. So um, if it's um, a general arousal situation, or if it's attention, uh, away from the stimulus or towards oneself and this and uh, and the situation and when well that's uh, when you so that's a vicious circle well when you uh, have some pain and you focus on this pain the pain gets more intense and uh, you have to get out of the circle somehow all right thank you very much i think we have a question in the uh, Sorry. Um, a question for Dr. Baumgartner, sorry. Um, you mentioned earlier on about pain memory. Now, I was actually in one of my tutorials the other day, and our tutor told us that because um, the pain centers are so diffuse in the brain, you don't actually remember pain, so I just want to know your perspective on that. Uh, sorry again. Um, well, remember pain. Mm. Um, so there's some, uh, well, conscious remembering and some unconscious remembering so um, uh, and that's well you cannot easily tell w w when's happening what so um, there, there was an interesting case I couldn't show because of time there was not enough time uh, when and so where the memory is stored of course is also an interesting question but how it can be triggered uh, by for instance by brain stimulation there was one case um, where a patient was undergoing neurosurgery and um, he, he wanted to, or he should get some uh, motor system stimulation and at some time some area in the thalamus was activated and uh, he presented like he had a real heart attack. So he said he had this chest pain and um, terrible pain was crying and um, everyone was thinking really he had a heart attack but this was really in a way a triggered memory on on one certain spot in the brain in the thalamus he, he re-experienced this situation of course it could be verified that it was no heart infection because well some blood measures were normal but um, so that was a very specific memory that was somehow woken up uh, that has been buried for many years and um, and pain memory, well, is, is, is learning in a way. So what, when, when you learn to, to find your way at night through your apartment, that's a more or less similar thing. Your synapses learn, and what happens often is more or less hardwired. And uh, similar things happen when, when you have regularly pain from some region. Uh, then the pathway is, let's say, better paved, in, an, in that case, of course, in a negative way. And when the original cause is gone, uh, the pathway is still there and the pain is staying there. So chronic pain can be, well, the pain chronification uh, can be interpreted as, well, pain memory. And some, there are some uh, very interesting therapeutic um, visions where there's brain stimulation when you can, well, uh, stop some part of the brain working for a while and the effects are very little. They are highly significant, but very little. And um, somebody said, well, uh, in rehabilitation, um, you have to work for weeks or months, really, with the patient to relearn or unlearn the, the, wrong, the, wrong, uh, the wrong memory to really learn from de novo again how the pathway should uh, function and you cannot, uh, once it is miswired, change that by putting some current uh, on the brain. You really have to learn everything new and uh, have a new body representation and or re-representation back to the normal way. So that's a, that's a long way to go and memory takes, takes long to, to be created and to make it, make it correct again has, has also takes a lot of time. I want to just ask if there's another question from Hamburg. Micah, can you tell me? Yes, we have two more questions. Well, I'll take one of okay. them. I'll take one and hold the other one because uh, we're going to have some coffee and tea in a few minutes and then we'll come back. And at the end, there'll be about a half an hour for more questions. Okay, so let me give me one of them, please. Okay. 
Hello, um, I've got a question concerning the presentation of Dr. Baumgartner, and it's concerning uh, psychosomatic pain. And I was wondering, because we, we can see psychosomatic pain on scans in the brain, but do we know if the nociceptors are actually activated? Are they firing? Are they involved at all? Is there anything that you can tell me about that? <laughs> Um, can can be both. So there can be, as we saw, a pain uh, without nociception that's possible. And um, and um, once, well, it's not easy or sometimes even impossible to clearly dissect what is in a way enhanced or even sometimes made up in the brain and what has a, a physical cause. Uh, it's never really 100%, and um, uh, if, even a psychological pain can, uh, that's a big uh, question now, even has, have as a second cause real bodily pain. So when, um, let's say when you, when you think there is something, um, it can happen that there at this place really occurs something. So one really weird thing is, maybe you've heard of the uh, symptom or of the, not the symptom, of the disease of fibromyalgia, which is a, a soft tissue, let's say, disease where you're hypersensitive at a number of spots at the body and sometimes it's so intense that during rest already the body is painful. And um, everybody was thinking, well, um, there's some hypersensitivity in the nervous system, or others were saying that the people are just making it up because nothing was found. And now uh, people found that these patients have a small fiber neuropathy. So the small nerve fibers, which are important to, to excite, so to, to lead to pain, seem to be altered in these patients. So either this is a secondary effect or the primary cause of the disease has been unnoticed for decades. Thank you. Thank you. Good, it's really lovely to hear the voices coming to us from Hamburg. I think this is working very nicely. So they're gonna have a cup of tea, we're gonna have a cup of tea, and in 15 minutes I'm gonna start shouting for you to come back in. So just drink up, you know, don't linger too much over the 10, 15 minutes, and we'll come back for the last talk.
my screen. It's a time shift. <laughs> Okay, I think we can start again. Uh, hello again, Hamburg. I see, I, I, I can see you on my little screen. I hope you enjoyed your cup of tea. I hope we all had our nice cup of tea. And now we're ready for our third and final speaker, um, who is Dr. David Bain, who is reader in philosophy at the University of Glasgow. Um, Dr. Bain was principal investigator on the Pain Project, which ran from 2012 to 13, and on the Value of Suffering Project, which ran from 2013 to 2016. His interests lie mainly in philosophy of mind and concern pain, the nature of pleasure and unpleasure, and perception. And the title of his talk this evening is Pains That Don't Hurt. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks, Anita, for inviting me, and thanks, everyone, for coming. So, yes, I, too, am going to talk about pain today. And in what follows, I want to give you a sense of the sorts of things that philosophers of mind think about in this area, and also to describe a bizarre condition that I, t I think tells us some, some, pr some surprising things about pain. Of course... First and foremost, um, pain can be, as we've already heard, and as we already know, an awful reality in people's lives. But I think this means that we really must try to theorize about it carefully and clearly, which is something that these days, I think, um, philosophers can contribute to. So according to an old stereotype, uh, philosophers are men who sit in their armchairs, stroking their beards, using pure reason to establish what we might call armchair truths, truths that we don't need to get out of the armchair in order to know. Now, perhaps philosophy was once a bit like that, in fact. Um, but thankfully, it's becoming, well, for a start, a less male affair. And it's also becoming a more interdisciplinary, empirically informed affair. And this makes philosophers, this is making philosophers revisit some of these armchair truths. And actually, I think pain provides a nice example of this. So consider, for example, this claim. Uh, the claim that all pains are unpleasant, that every pain hurts. Let's call this the hurts claim. You've got to name claims in philosophy. This is the hurts claim. Um, now, once, I take it, most philosophers thought this was just simply obvious, indeed common sense, indeed actually a necessary truth. Just as bachelors are essentially male, so too pains are essentially unpleasant, went the thought. Indeed, it's not just philosophers, and it's not just common sense, but scientific orthodoxy. As we've already seen tonight, actually, the International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So the Hertz claim can seem to be just clearly true. However, today I want to suggest that it's not clearly true. In fact, I don't think it's true at all, because I think there not only could be, but in fact are pains that don't hurt. Now at this point you might be tempted to say, well, yes, David, but you're pushing at an open door here. This is old news. The Hertz claim is obviously refuted by lots of cases that most of us know about. But actually, I think the relatively well-known cases don't refute the Hertz, claim, uh, the Hertz claim. So let's start by looking at four such cases. So first of all, you may have heard, in fact, I know you have, because it was mentioned tonight, um, of congenital pain insensitivity. This crops up in the newspapers every now and again. And the idea is that from birth, pain insensitives are such that when their bodies are damaged, they feel pressure and sometimes temperature, but not pain. Why? Well, arguably, because they just can't feel pain. So does this show that there are some pains that don't hurt? Well, no, I don't think it does. Pain insensitivity is real, and it's a real problem, of course, again, as has been mentioned, for pain insensitives. 
Since in the rest of us, pain helps us avoid damage, so pain insensitivity is very bad for one's health. But I don't think pain insensitivity does undermine the Hertz claim. Since the evidence indicates that it's a case, well, sorry, the evidence indicates not that pain insensitives feel non-unpleasant or, if you like, neutral pain, but that they simply just don't feel pain at all. Not least, by the way, because they don't report pain when injured. So the evidence is quite strong that they're just not feeling pain. Here's a second case. Um, soldiers who receive serious battlefield injuries sometimes say things like this, that their horrific injuries didn't hurt them at all, or at least at first, when they were still in the heat of battle. Um, victims of shark attacks sometimes say similar things when their legs are chomped off and things like that. So does this kind of case show that there are pains that don't hurt? Well, again, I think not. And really for the same reason, um, these two look like cases not of non-unpleasant or, if you like, neutral pains, but really cases of no pain at all. Here's a third kind of case, lobotomies. Now, lobotomies used to be performed as a treatment for chronic pain, amongst other things. And sometimes patients after the lobotomy would um, report its effects as follows. They'd say things like this. I still, I still feel the old chronic pain, but it no longer bothers me as much or no longer bothers me at all. So does this, the fact that the patient would say something like the pain no longer bothers me after the lobotomy, does that show that there are pains that don't hurt? Well, again, I think arguably not, actually, in this case. To see why, it's helpful to distinguish two kinds of unpleasantness that are often involved in ordinary cases of pain. So on the one hand, there's what you might call pain's own primary unpleasantness, okay, where that's the unpleasantness of the pain itself, as it were. On the other hand, downstream of that, there's what's sometimes called the secondary or emotional suffering of pain. And the idea is that that's the negative emotional consequences of the pain. So, for example, anxiety about what the pain means. Does it mean you're ill? Does it mean you've got some terrible condition? Worry that the pain itself might get worse. That sort of thing. That's what I'm calling secondary emotional suffering. Now, arguably, what lobotomies eliminate is not the pain's primary unpleasantness, not the pain's own unpleasantness, if you like, but that downstream secondary emotional suffering that pain in normal cases causes. So again, the thought is that what the lobotomized feel isn't pain without its own unpleasantness, the unpleasantness is still there, but rather pain without its characteristic effects of worry, anger, irritation, and the like. As you might put it, the pain of the lobotomized still hurts, but the, the lobotomized worry about it less. So here's a fourth case, masochism. Masochism can involve, for example, a person enjoying eating a curry that's so hot that it's painful to eat, or someone wanting to be whipped in a certain context by a sexual partner. Now, these cases, too, might strike us as cases of pains that don't hurt. Indeed, in this case, pains that are actually pleasant rather than unpleasant. But in fact, I think masochist pains do hurt. After all, masochists speak of seeking out people who will ensure that the whipping hurts. And indeed, they behave as though it hurts. They flinch and grimace and the rest. Why then do they seem to enjoy the pain? Well, I suggest not because um, the pain itself is pleasant rather than, un rather than unpleasant, but rather because the, the pain and its unpleasantness cause other things that they want or enjoy. So the pain and its unpleasantness are a means to something that they want. So for example, in the curry case, they, uh, the pain might be a means to the enhanced taste sensitivity that the hotness of food can produce. Or in the whipping case, perhaps a means to the desired feeling of being subordinate to another. Or perhaps in both cases, a means to the enjoyment that some get from struggling with the limits of their endurance. 
So arguably in those four cases, insensi pain and sensitivity, heat of battle injuries, lobotomies, and masochism, um, none of those arguably refute the Hertz claim. But there is a fifth and final case that I think might. So in 1928, Austrian psychiatrists Erwin Stengel and Paul Schilder coined the term pain asymbolia for an exceptionally rare neurological condition that they'd identified, apparently caused by strokes and brain tumors in previously normal adults. Now, Stengel and Schilder did various things to their asymbolic patients in 1928 that you could get away with back then. So they pinched them, for example. Uh, they pricked them with pins. They gave them electric shocks. And they immersed their hands in very hot and very cold water. And when they did things to these asymbolic patients, unsurprisingly, their patients said they felt pain. It's pain. Yet much more surprisingly, their patients denied that the pains were unpleasant. And equally surprisingly, the patients didn't grimace or wince or withdraw from the pinchings and the prickings. And they didn't resent the people who were pinching and pricking them. So is this, at last, a case of pains that don't hurt, pains that are not unpleasant? And I think it might be. Consider, after all, a paradigmatic asymbolic a fictitious one, let's call him Abe. Now notice Abe's case differs from the cases we looked at earlier. Abe is different from the insensitives. Unlike insensitives, Abe does say that he's in pain. So he doesn't seem insensitive to pain. It doesn't look like he's incapable of feeling pain. Rather, he seems indifferent to pain. It's there, but he's indifferent to it. Abe also looks different from the lobotomized. It's true that, like them, he doesn't have the typical emotional response to pain. But if that was all that he was missing, and if the pain's own primary unpleasantness was still there, then we'd expect him to withdraw from these pinch, pinches and pinpricks, as the lobotomized do, and to, say that his, and to say that his pain was unpleasant. But he doesn't do that. And finally, Abe's case looks different from the masochist case. The masochists, I argued a moment ago, seek pain as a means to other things that they want or enjoy. But there's no sign of pain being a means to an end in Abe's case. Moreover, he, unlike the masochist, denies that his pain is unpleasant. So to summarize so far, pain asymbolia looks different from the other cases. Unlike them, it does seem to involve pain that is not at all unpleasant, pain lacking its own primary unpleasantness. Hence, given asymbolia, I think we should at last reject, reject the Hertz claim that all pains um, hurt, and instead endorse what you might call the neutrality claim, the claim that some pains don't hurt, indeed that there are neutral pains, for instance, asymbolic pains. Now that's surprising enough. But is there anything else that pain asymbolia teaches us? Well, I think there is. First of all, it teaches us that philosophers would do well to get out of the armchair. Second, I also think it tells us that normal, unpleasant pains are, in a sense, composite states, which was being mentioned earlier, involving at least, on the one hand, a sensory component, the pain sensation, and on the other hand, an affective component, the unpleasantness. And the idea is it's that effective component that is missing in Abe's case. And in fact, I want to argue that there's a third thing that pain asymbolia might teach us about pain, and indeed about the nature specifically, not so much of pain actually, but of pain's unpleasantness. So to make this third point, let's start with something that's often missed, um, and a puzzle that arises out of something that's often missed. Pain asymbolics actually have deficits of two different kinds. As we've already seen, they're pain indifferent. That is, they say and do odd things when given pain-causing stimuli. But what I've not yet said, and what is often missed, is that they also seem to be quite generally threat indifferent. Again, they're indifferent to threats in general, not just to pain. One indication of this, and my wife has insisted that I give a warning at this, at this stage that there's going to be some um, rather alarming pictures going up. I think I've given this 
talk often enough that I, I didn't sort of notice that. Uh, one indication of this is that they self-harm. They p place their hands in flames. Um, they sometimes, there's cases of them pricking themselves um, and jamming things um, into their own eyes. Yes, that's the one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> another indication of this general threat indifference of theirs um, is that they're unresponsive to the sight or sound or verbal warning of threats to their bodily integrity. So, for example, when Stengel and others came at them with hammers and knives and needles, they didn't respond fearfully or aversively. When they were verbally threatened with injury, they didn't respond aversively. And when one of Stengel's patients heard what he knew was a lorry behind him, he failed to respond and was almost run over. Okay, so the point is there's these two kinds of deficits, pain indifference on the one hand, but a more general threat indifference on the other hand. Now, as Colin Klein, who's an American philosopher now based in Australia, has pointed out, these twin deficits of asymbolics pose a puzzle. Namely, why should asymbolics have both sets of deficits? Pain indifference on the one hand and this general threat indifference on the other hand. Why should those two sets of deficits go, go together like this? Is it just an accident or is there some connection between them? Is there some unifying explanation of why asymbolics have both the pain indifference and the general threat indifference? To appreciate this puzzle, consider the neutrality claim, the idea that asymbolics pain is not unpleasant. Now, I've claimed today that that's true. It's not unpleasant. I've suggested it's what explains um, asymbolics pain indifference. But notice it doesn't explain their threat indifference, their general threat indifference. Again, the asymbolic pains don't hurt might explain their indifference to pain, but it doesn't obviously explain their indifference to threat more generally. It doesn't explain why they fail to avoid threats of bodily damage when not in pain. After all, notice that the rest of us don't avoid bodily damage only to avoid pain. So you might think, look, it's obvious. If you, if you can't feel pain, then why would you um, avoid threats in general? But of course, people do avoid threats in general, not just to avoid pain. A good way of making that point is that pain insensitives who are incapable of fe feeling pain do try to avoid bodily damage, unlike Abe, the asymbolic. So what Klein thinks we need is a unified explanation of asymbolia, one that illuminates both asymbolic's pain indifference and their threat indifference. So what could that unified explanation be? Well, Klein makes the following, I think, really interesting suggestion as follows. He thinks that humans uh, typically care about our bodies in some quite fundamental biological sense. We care about our bodies and our bodily integrity, except for asymbolics. Um, he thinks that asymbolics lack this basic kind of care that the rest of us have for our own bodily integrity. He thinks perhaps what's gone on here is that their brain damage has in some way destroyed their capacity for this basic kind of care about their bodily integrity. As I'll put his idea, asymbolics suffer from care lack. And Klein thinks that this care lack explains their general threat indifference. How? Well, ask yourself, why doesn't Abe flinch when threatened? Uh, why doesn't he avoid lorries that he can hear? Because, Klein answers quite simply, he doesn't care about his own body. He lacks that basic kind of care. Now, I think Klein might be onto something here, but I've argued in a paper that this isn't yet the unified explanation we were looking for. I agree that Kerlach looks like a good explanation of asymbolic's general threat indifference. What's not clear, though, and what Klein doesn't explain, is how Kerlach is supposed to illuminate asymbolic's pain indifference. Here's why I say that. Why would Abe's not caring about his body mean that he wouldn't respond normally to his pain, a mental state? Again, we've suggested he doesn't normally respond to his pain because his pain is not unpleasant. But the question is, put another way, how would his not caring about his body explain why his pain is not unpleasant? So the care lack explanation doesn't seem to touch his pain indifference. In short, we still seem to have two explanations where we wanted one. First, the neutrality claim 
the idea that the asymbolic's pain is not unpleasant explains their pain indifference. And secondly, the care lack explanation, the one that Klein gives, explains their threat indifference. But we were looking for a unified explanation. That's not yet one of those. To do better, I suggest, we should turn to a big question that philosophers have thought a lot about. Namely, what does pain's unpleasantness consist in? When pains are unpleasant, as they typically are, what does that unpleasantness consist in? What makes a pain unpleasant in that sense? Now, philosophers offer, of course, various theories about this. Here, just to give you a flavor, are two theories of pain's unpleasantness that different philosophers give. Sorry, there's the question. Um, the first theory is the desire theory, which at times Klein seems inclined to. And it says your pain experience is unpleasant when and because you want that experience to cease for its own sake, for no further purpose. So again, the idea is that all it amounts to, all it means for your pain to be unpleasant is for you to dislike the experience in that sense, the sense that you want it to stop. Here's a second uh, theory of pain's unpleasantness, imperativism, which at other times Klein seems, Klein seems inclined to. It says your pain experience is unpleasant when and because it incorporates a command from your body for you to stop doing what you're doing. So the thought is that pain experiences um, convey commands from the body to you, um, and when that command gets through, that constitutes the unpleasantness of the pain. Now, we don't have time to go into those in detail, but I just wanted to give you a sense of other theories. For myself, I prefer a third view of pain's unpleasantness, which I call evaluativism. So what does this third view say? It says that... Like visual experiences, pain experiences convey information. In particular, they tell you something. And in particular, they tell you something, something that might be right or might be wrong, about your own body. Secondly, on this view, what makes an experience a pain experience is what it tells you about your body. Namely, rightly or wrongly, that a part of your body is damaged. And here's the key bit. And in addition, your pain is unpleasant, not just a pain, but an unpleasant pain, when and because that pain experience additionally tells you, or conveys the additional information, that that bodily damage is bad for you. So again, according to evaluativism, unpleasant pains are pains because they present parts of your body to you as being damaged, and they're unpleasant pains because they present that damage as being bad for you. Okay, so I've argued elsewhere that evaluativism is superior to those other theories of pain's unpleasantness for various reasons, but one of those reasons I now think is that evaluativism helps us to understand asymbolia. So why do I say that? Because I think that putting evaluativism, that theory I just gave you, Together with Klein's care lack idea, that idea that asymbolics don't care about their bodies in this rather fundamental sense, put those two things together, and I think you do get, arguably, the unified explanation we were seek seeking of asymbolics' pain indifference on the one hand and their threat indifference on the other hand. This is going to go quite quickly, but to see why, consider, first of all, a simple model. Suppose I start kicking your car. Will you think that that's bad for you? Will you evaluate that as a bad thing for you? Well, probably, but only if you care about your car. Now, perhaps we can say something similar to this in the pain case. Suppose that your leg is damaged. Will, you exper will your experience present that damage as bad for you? Well, the thought is probably, but only if you care about your leg. Now, what's all that got to do with pain asymbolia? Well, with that model in place, we can now say the following things. By contrast with Abe, the asymbolic, you do care about your bodily integrity. So your pain presents damage to your body um, as bad for you. And that's why the evaluativist will say your pain hurts, since that evaluation is what hurting or unpleasantness is. But Abe, the story goes, doesn't care about his body. That's the thing that Klein gave us. So although he does experience the damage, hence does feel pain, his experience doesn't present the damage as bad for him. 
And that's why his pain, though real, doesn't hurt. Um, and that, of course, explains his indifference to pain. And that same Kerlach recall is also why he doesn't avoid threats in general. It explains his indifference to threats in general, the lorry that he hears behind him and that sort of thing. So if evaluativism is true, Abe's alleged care lack would explain both his pain indifference and his threat indifference. And that could be the unifying explanation we were looking for. And enabling that explanation is one advantage, I think, of this evaluativist view um, of pains and pleasantness. It's one advantage that view has over, for example, the desire theory or the imperativist theory. So that's all a bit, hooray. <laughs> so that's all a bit quick, of course, um, but at least gives you a flavor of the sorts of things that philosophers think about when they're thinking about pain. In conclusion, very quickly, I've suggested that the usual cases, as I called them, pain ins insensitivity, heat of battle cases, lobotomies, masochism, don't undermine the idea that every pain hurts. But pain asymbolia, I've suggested, does. It shows that typical unpleasant pains, to put it a different way, have separable sensory and effective components, the pain on the one hand and its unpleasantness on the other hand. Moreover, Klein's Kerlach idea, I think, gives us a nice unified account of pain asymbolics, pain indifference on the one hand and threat indifference on the other hand, but only if you're an evaluativist about pain's unpleasantness, which he, by the way, isn't. Um, and that, I think, is one of the advantages that evaluativism has over other theories of pain's unpleasantness. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's fantastic. Um, now, I'm going to start with a question that has come to me from the live stream. Um, driving? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, one thing I should say right at the outset is that um, the evidence on pain asymbolia is very patchy and quite old. Um, so I don't know, um, but I take it it should. I mean, if, if this threat and, um, th uh, threat and difference claim is right, that pain asymbolics are generally indifferent to threats, um, then um, I would imagine that it would. But again, I, I should hedge everything with the evidence is a bit thin. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask Hamburg. Micah, do we have a question from Hamburg yet, or shall I take one from the audience here? We, we have questions. Yes, please. Okay. First question. Hi, uh, I'm Dinek. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Baumgartner something. Um, you used the definition of pain where, it's, where, where it was described as unpleasant and like Mr. Bain also mentioned earlier, there are some people who enjoy pain and I would like to know how you would explain this. Yes, I'm told that if you just bring the microphone and just, just you can be heard, okay? So you don't have to bend into it. Let's just see if it works, okay? So you just speak and we'll see. So the question is why masochists uh, like pain in a way, more or less direct. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yes. Um, I have no clear answer to that, of course. And uh, yeah, as uh, Dr. Bain said, they, they uh, use the pain to, uh, well, to fulfill some uh, desires that, that are connected to pain. So they feel pain as a, as a stimulus, but they uh, like, maybe they like to get pain to feel to be whatever inferior to some uh, domination process or whatever. Um, there is some uh, different condition uh, also resembling a little bit um, to that, uh, like in um, borderline patients, uh, because they injure themselves. However, not, I wouldn't say as pleasure, but um, for other reasons, to, um, to make them feel something again. So they uh, don't have this unpleasantness factor, let's say, what normally uh, 
occurs together with pain and they give themselves pain um, to feel to feel better, which is of course a paradox, but um, there may be a little parallel about that. So there could be a parallel in brain processing. What has been found in neuroimaging is that the borderline patients uh, of course, had normal pain perception, let's say, in their nerve fibers and their sensory component is fully normal. They can distinguish, uh, two point, have two-point discriminations, uh, at least as good as uh, healthy uh, volunteers, but the, the more or less the evaluation of the pain uh, is different. So uh, they are, in fact, uh, not, well, they, they are giving pain to themselves, yeah. David, do you want to say anything about that case? Uh, yeah, th those are interesting uh, cases, of course. Um, and I, I guess I, I, yeah, I think we have to be careful to say that those pains aren't unpleasant because those cases could also be cases where, well, if you draw this distinction between the primary unpleasantness of pain on, on the one hand and the secondary unpleasantness of pain, there's, so the sort of uh, basic unpleasantness and then the, sta the downstream emotional effects, I think there is a distinction to be drawn there for lots of reasons, not least, by the way, that some of the downstream emotional effects are emotions directed at the unpleasantness of pain. They're, they're worries and anxieties, for example, about the unpleasantness, that it might get worse and so forth. So I think there is a distinction to be drawn there. And once it's drawn, it might very well be that cases of people that cause themselves pain uh, in order to feel better or feel, feel again and so on are causing themselves unpleasant pain, but they never, nevertheless, like masochists, although you know, different in other respects, uh, do it as a means to an end, and a means to, uh, to achieve something else that they want. Um, so um, that doubtless would mean that the pain wouldn't have all the emotional consequences that a pain might have in other chronic cases, for example, but I think it, it might very well still be in those cases unpleasant. I mean, that will in the end be an empirical matter, but I think there's conceptual space for those being cases of unpleasant pain that's sought as a means to something else and consequently has some different emotional consequences from, from other cases. I suppose it could be also control, just to show control. Yeah. I think that's yeah. one of the things that um, has been said. Yeah, and we have, um, we have two questions over here. Let's start with the one in the front, Tom. Thank you. One for the panel generally. Um, would you then suggest that if someone has elective surgery, they would feel less pain than if it was taken from them uh, during an accident or something similar like that? I'm just following on your, well, if they don't really care about it, clearly elective surgery suggests, you know, take my arm off. Do you think they would then experience less pain? Who would like to take that first? I can start. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go start? ahead. I'll give you time to think. <laughs> um, so I don't think I'm going to answer your question like, head on here, but <laughs> let me skirt around the issue a little bit. I think that there's a concept within psychology about injustice and people who feel like their pain is not justified. So, for example, they've been in a car accident and, um, and they've become disabled by it or uh, you've got a high-performing um, athlete who then gets taken out by another player on the pitch and, and can't play again. Those people, and, and the, the, the research is young, but those people are showing kind of higher signs of disability and higher levels of pain. So I think that there's, you know, do you, do you go in with the expectation that you need the surgery? And if you elect for it, then, then you need it, and maybe you're more motivated to get better and, and not feel the pain. But I think that, that this concept around the injustice of pain is going to be really interesting over the next five years or so to see where that goes. Um, so, like I said, I didn't tackle it head on, but hopefully that gives a, a bit more context around it. David? Yeah, um, yeah thanks for the time to think. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess w with elective surgery, I, I don't think that somebody wants some surgery shows that they don't care about their body. In fact, it might very well show the opposite, that they do care about uh, their body. I also don't think um, it means that they wouldn't experience um, what's done to their body as bad. They may, may not think it's bad. So there's a difference between judgments and belief on the one hand um, and experience on the other. So you, know, you can see the Muller liar lines in this visual illusion as different lengths, even though you know and believe that they are um, exactly the same length. So I think that's another important distinction 
to draw. So I bat the case off that way. Nonetheless, I sh in all honesty, I should admit at this point that there is a case that worries me a lot, thanks to a colleague in Paris, um, uh, Frédéric de Vimor, who's, um, who's interested in, um, I think it's called somatoparaphrenia, I probably mispronounced it, also I think sometimes called alien lim limb syndrome. Um, and she has argued that that's a counterexample to the kind of line that Colin Klein on the one hand and I on the other hand are taking here, because in those cases, uh, the subjects or the patients uh, seem repelled by a part of their body, uh, an arm, for, uh, uh, for example, um, and sometimes to the point that they actually injure that part of their body, and they want the arm, um, uh, they want it cut off, um, but they also, as I say, injure it. And you might think, and she argues, that on the face of it, this is a clear case of someone not caring, not about the whole body, but a particular part of their body. So her claim is that our approach should predict um, that those people can't feel unpleasant pains in that part of their body. They should be sort of localized asymbolics. They should have asymbolia with respect to that part of their body, but annoyingly, they don't. They're not asymbolics with respect to that part of the body. They see, well, she argues, and, and very compellingly, I should say, um, but I want to look more at the data, uh, but she suggests that they have utterly normal pain responses even in that part of the body. So it's an excellent question, even though I think the elective surgery um, is a bit of a red, red herring in a way. Okay, I'm going to take another question from Hamburg. Maika? Yeah, and this question is from me, and it's essentially for uh, Dr. Bain, but also for Ulf Baumgartner, um, about the pain asymbolia. And the reason I'm asking is because I thought that people with lesions in the insula tended to show the phenomena of pain asymbolia. And that pain asymbolia can be seen in people who are affected by extreme pain, they still feel the pain, so this is not the endorphin system kicking in, but they are disconnected from it, but it can be reversed, and it's in people who are close to death. And the reason I'm interested in it is because I've had actually experienced this myself, and I was wondering if the, the lobotomy is just a less extreme version of the pain asymbolia. And that somebody who seems to have pain asymbolia in the absence of acute illness or life-threatening illness just has some gen well congenital or some defects or some lesions in the insula. Has anybody looked at that? Not that I know. So, um, uh, well, uh, I have to think a moment. <laughs> David, of, I think. A philosopher who was tortured by somebody and completely disconnected and said, if the torturing continues, I will lose the leg, the leg will come off, and then the leg came off, and he said, I told you so. So people can, in extreme situations of pain, they still feel the pain, they will say it's unpleasant, but they will not care. And even if you pinch them, they will not shrink away from it. So it's different to the lobotomy, but it would be the pain asymbolia. Sorry, th th that wouldn't be a case of pain asymbolia because th th that would be a case where that secondary um, affect only was missing. So the, the downstream emotional consequences and, and um, that does seem to be um, what's going um, on in the lobotomy case, that those downstream emotional consequences are missing, but the pain is still unpleasant. Asymb I mean, it doesn't matter how we define it, of course, but asymbolia, as I was defining it is supposed to be a case where actually the it's not just the downstream emotional consequences that are missing but the unpleasantness of the pain um, itself so there's no unpleasantness at all um, as as it were um, I mean as for which bit of the brain causes it and is involved I understand that it is sometimes the insular or seems sometimes to be the insular but um, I defer to colleagues <laughs> to colleagues on on that question well, well, but, but well I'm not sure about the the role of the insula in, in pain asymbolia um, but Mike, about your question, so um, I'm not sure whether I really understood it correctly. So um, in that case of that certain situation, you mean some people in a way suddenly shut off their, um, well, their, their, their uh, caring part and, and just uh, let the torture go on without uh, feeling it or what was... What was well, 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 this is exactly you? the point I'm coming to because how do you know a pain is not unpleasant or whether they just don't care enough to say? Whether they 
this, this is a real problem because I actually think that they will still say they would still consider it unpleasant, but they don't care, so they will not they will not describe it as unpleasant. Well, it could be a little bit the same effect when you give opiates. So they they work on different levels, also on the spinal cord. But um, when you ask the patients, they also say they feel the pain, but they don't care. You know, it's it's maybe the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that's exactly my question. Because I, I'm, I'm not convinced pain asymbolia is really that different, and I do think that pain is involved, but that unpleasantness of pain is still involved. And I was just wondering if, if somebody with pain asymbolia, if there's anything, if it, it occurs in extreme situations, then we can explain it with top-down control of sorts. But if it is somebody who just inherently has pain asymbolia, has anybody looked at, that was my original question, has anybody looked at what is it in their brain that is different? Because that would then explain the rest. Uh, well, I, I'm not aware of uh, work on, in that field. I don't know. Thank you. We have another question. Um, hold on, Micah. I think, I think we have one question here. Um, and then I'm going to take one from the internet and then I'll come back to you. We have a few minutes. Yes. Um, hi. Um, my question was that a lot of this research is based upon pain that is physical. Is that correct? Um, and I was just wondering um, what your views were on emotional pain. Um, because that's, especially when people are heartbroken, um, they say that they feel the pain. Um, what is your uh, view upon that? And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's some evidence on on well, em of course uh, there is something like emotional pain. Well, everyone probably knows that, and um, the question is why is do we feel the pain not not let's say not in the finger or somewhere in the head like like in migraine, but somewhere in in our gut or inside our body? That's a question that came up uh, in in the aisle. Um, after the first part, and um, well, of course, that's also not really clear. But the, the network that lights up is again similar to the uh, whatever pain network or salience network when you do imaging. So there was some imaging study, uh, also highly uh, highly ranked, uh, published in Science, I think 2014 something, by Tanya Singer. And she did a study where um, uh, people were in the scanner and their spouse was, well, tortured in a way. Well, not really tortured, but uh, given pain to them. And, um, and when, so that was the, the, the real condition. And then was a second condition when somebody else, the, the person in the scanner didn't know, uh, obtained some pain procedure. And um, the network that light up when, when the spouse was, well, tortured uh, was very similar to this salience network. So then again, you can say, well, it's, it's just salient, what's just more interested in that situation than in the other. Uh, and it, it has nothing to do with pain, but we know there must be something behind it. So if it's not the network, there must be some correlate of this. And an interesting question why it is in, inside our body really and not in, in the head or in the limbs could be that um, there's a relatively poor, pro, poor um, localized projection of these uh, nerve fibers. So um, some people or many people don't know that most of the fibers by far, the, the most of our nerve fibers are so-called, well, in, in principle, nociceptive fibers, so 80% or more than 80%, and the, mid, ma, the vast majority is uh, innervating the inner parts of our body, so the organs, the gut, the heart, and everything. And um, when maybe they, all these are the center where these uh, neurons project to, also one of this is the insula, and when there's a back projection from the insula under that conditions, that could explain that, but this hasn't been properly controlled, so that's just my thinking. David, did you, did well, either of you? Emma, Sorry, Emma. Emma. Um, 
It's a good question. So I, my answer is short. I haven't really researched it. And all of the pain that I research is physical pain. A lot of people will say, what about, do you research physical or psychological pain? And my answer normally is, well, all pain is psychological. It's all felt in the brain because that's where we process it. And it's impacted by our mood and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think things like grief and heartbreak, important research topics, but not one that I've ever endeavored to go into. Um, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't add much, I think, except to say that um, uh, the evaluativist line I was taking on pains and pleasantness is also, in fact, more often taken as an account um, uh, of emotional pain, that different, um, and indeed of emotions in general, the different kinds of emotions are different kinds of sort of felt evaluations. Um, so I, I think there's scope for a sort of general evaluativist approach to pain on the one hand, physical pain on the one hand, and, and um, emotional pain on the other hand. Actually, the difficulty in some ways becomes tr um, ensuring that you've got the materials to be able to give an account of what's different among these states. I mean, one obvious thing that's different, I suppose, is that in the pain case, according to an evaluativist, what's getting evaluated is some kind of bodily state. It's not clear that's going on in the case of, I don't know, guilt or grief and so on. But nonetheless, they may both be evaluative, uh, nonetheless. Okay, Maike, can I take one more from Hamburg? <laughs> um, the question has kind of been answered. We had a similar question here, so we don't have any further questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, can we have a question down here? Hi. Um, yeah, it's mainly a question for Dr. Bain, but kind of for all of the speakers. And it's like in reference to what you were saying about um, care lack and threat indifference. And I was wondering with um, asymbolic patients, how far you could compare them to people suffering from like mental health illnesses, kind of like with self-harm and suicide, because they kind of express a sort of care lack and indifference to how threat affects them. And then kind of as an extension of that, maybe if you could draw any findings from asymbolic patients to apply to um, people struggling with mental health issues and, you know, seeing if they are the same brain regions and how far you could compare them. So, yeah. Excellent. A really interesting uh, question. Um, uh, I mean, the empirical literature is, isn't something that, uh, particularly on that, that I, I know very well. So, um, uh, I, I shouldn't claim any expertise there. But a, a couple of thoughts leap to mind. I mean, first of all, the suicide case is interesting. You might think at first that that's a sort of counterexample uh, to me, that somebody is, who's suicidal doesn't care, a little bit like the first, one of the earlier questions, doesn't care about their body, so they, sh on my view, should be incapable of having unpleasant pains in their body. But I, I guess in that case, I, I don't think um, uh, someone being suicidal shows that they don't care about their bodily integrity. It's just that they want to achieve something else for other reasons that might involve uh, doing harm uh, to their body. But... I think there are in really interesting other cases. In fact, one was mentioned earlier, opiates, um, which may have characteristics quite a lot like uh, pain asymbolia. Um, and indeed, as you say, some uh, uh, psychological uh, conditions. So I've heard it said, and this is something I need to pursue, and as I say, I don't know the empirical literature well enough, but the depersonalization syndrome. Um, people who have that syndrome, apparently, um, in certain cases, um, have unusual responses to pain, which looks not unlike uh, pain a symbolia, and I suppose, I mean, this is highly speculative, but you might think that um, a, a similar story to the one that I was trying to tell might be able to be told in that, in that kind of case, that they're depersonalized um, from their situation, from their body, that there's some sort of lack of care, um, unlike perhaps the suicide case, um, that maybe is playing a role in explaining the unusual uh, responses to pain. Okay, um, I think it's Seven fifteen. It may even be a bit later because I think my clock is a bit slow. Um, so I think I'm going to have to draw this to a close. And I'm very sorry about this because there are some online questions that I haven't been able to take. So I apologize to people online. Um, because we are now in three split in three directions, it's inevitable that there are going to be more questions than we can get answers for. But I hope this has at least provoked you to think more about these topics and to try and pursue the answers um, for yourselves, maybe by looking things up. We have a program, and if you look at the program, you'll see that there's some recommended readings in it for you, for anybody, um, at least in Hamburg or here in the audience. They have a program that they can look at.
So thank you so much. And may I just um, tell you that the next uh, event in the, in the Brain in Mind series is going to be on Thursday, the 3rd of February at 5 o'clock. And it's going to be Color and the Brain. And then in Trinity term, and that's the 12th of May, it's Synesthesia and the Brain. So we hope to see you and your friends and colleagues at those future events. So join me in thanking our speakers tonight. Thank you very much. Hamburg. It was wonderful to have you. I can see this little group and it's a, a lovely group to see and maybe in the future we'll be able to get you on the screen but it was good to hear you. Thank you very much. They're waving to us. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you. We're waving to you. Okay, they're waving back. Thank you very much. Good night everybody. <laughs>